With inflation numbers shooting to record highs now and the whole conversation around taxes staying firmly within what they call the Overton window of past policy, can our politics heal the tears in our social fabric? Our capital and labor classes are separated more than ever by policy. I'm Clay Aiken, and this week, Politicon welcomes millionaire authors of the new book, Tax the Rich, How Lies, Loopholes, and Lobbyists Make the Rich Even Richer. Morris Pearl and Erica Payne are joining us this week on How the Heck to discuss the inequalities that drive the division in our country and how we can fix them. Do they have the answers that'll bring our country together? Can our leaders fully focus on the factors driving our divisions? And what will it take to heal our rifts in time? And of course, how the heck are we going to get along? What, how did you two meet, first of all? Well, so we, I think we just met from kind of in and around politics, basically. Um, I lived in New York for a long time. New York is, um, you know, Morris is from New York. So we had been in and around politics and kind of you know, knew of each other, I guess, Morris. And then um, during 2010, during the lame duck session of Congress, when it became clear that President Obama was going to cave to Republican demands to extend the Bush tax cuts, um, I organized a bunch of millionaires to sign a letter that basically said, for the good of the country, raise our taxes. And Morris was one of those signers. And so over the years, we got closer. Um, and then a couple years in, maybe three years in, Morris was kind of bored at his job at BlackRock. And we went and had lunch and, um, and I said, why don't you come work with me full time? And he said, well, what would I do? And I said, I don't really know, but we could probably figure something out. And, um, so we just started working together since then. And he, um, I don't know, he's been a fantastic, I guess, business partner is a good way to put it. We built an organization that's now 10 years old. It has 22 staff people. Um, you know, we're constantly doing media and public education efforts, trying to talk to people about how important this tax code is. It affects their daily life, whether they see that or not. And um, so we've been working together ever since really closely. It's been great. Morris, do you feel like you have joined some the camp of, of I don't know, not the enemy camp, because obviously you agree with it, but you really chose to to move your your career right now in a direction <laughs> that a lot of people probably look at you and say, wait a second, you're fighting against your own interests in some ways, right? You know, not too many people that I actually see, you know, from day to day. You know, I can think of once or twice when I've actually met people I know who, who you know, were actually opposed to the policies we're working on for one reason or another. But pretty much everyone around here agrees that we have too much inequality in our country, that it's destabilizing. You know, the, the story from the introduction of the book is that I was having lunch at a due diligence meeting in a top floor penthouse dining room at a bank in Greece, Athens, Greece one day. And I walked over to the window so people wouldn't see I was taking two desserts from the buffet. And <laughs> Sounds I like me. <laughs> saw, I saw a parade for a minute, and I was thinking, it's not a holiday. We're working. These guys are working. And I realized it was a riot moving down the street. And I walked back to, you know, rejoin these guys. And, you know, I thought to myself, are we really doing any good for anybody else except for these couple of dozen people whose jobs we were trying to save by getting their bank bailed out from the IMF? And, you know, and the, and that was a few months before I decided to join Erica and work full time on doing this kind of work because I don't want America to be like Greece was in 2013. You know, I don't want America to be like South Africa was in the late 70s and 1980s. Not None of those things ended well for the rich people either. And I really feel that we're on a bad course. There's... There's, you know, people uprisings in the streets, you know, as we speak. So we, we, I touched on this a bit in the, in the intro, but just to give people a little clearer picture of what the heck we're talking about here, you guys are, you have written a book, um, Tax the Rich, that's titled Tax the Rich. Um, definitely a disruptive title, which I think a lot of people will grab, maybe not 
rich folks, <laughs> too many of them, but you found that, I mean, it's not just, it's not just the working class, the, the blue collar class that necessarily would like to see the rich taxed. It's folks who, you know, live with wealth and privilege who also recognize that the tax code is not necessarily fair. So give us an example, uh, Erica, you can do it, or, or Morris, whoever, of, of kind of the premise of what you start talking about. It's not just tax codes, but it's the, the, the loopholes in the tax codes and the systems that are in place in government to create laws for tax codes, lobbyists, et cetera, that have really benefited those who have wealth and allowed this disparity to grow? Yeah, we've been on a multi-decade trajectory in um, in our economy and the base part of our economy, the real engine block of our economy, which is the tax code. Over the last 70 years, the obligation of the wealthiest people in the country and corporations has just consistently gone down. By way of comparison, um, after World War II, the top marginal income tax rate was 94%. Mm -hmm. In the 50s, it was 91%. Today, it's 37%. Corporations used to bring in about 30% of the revenues to the federal government. Now they bring in about 7 And the thing that we talk about in the book, the subtitle of the book is um, – how lies, loopholes, and lobbyists make the rich even richer. If you really dive into the tax code, Clay, it is just a house of cards. It is held together by the most absurd rationalizations, by quasi-intellectual nonsense um, that's perpetuated and advanced and sold to the public through some of the most powerful people in the country, whether it's politicians or CEOs. They let's, insist that if we do things differently, the world will collapse, and and they're wrong. Well, let me let me ask you to break that down for us a bit because it's something that I think most people don't know, um, and when they are told about it, it sometimes gets real complicated and and into the weeds. But yeah. let's talk about instead of the weeds. What you mentioned just a second ago about those top marginal tax rates. So right after World War II, under Truman or under under who Eisenhower, what was the top rate? It was ninety four percent. Ninety four percent was the top. Now I just want to make sure that folks who are listening understand this because everybody's thinking, "Hell, you're not taking ninety four percent of my money." Tax codes are complicated, right? So. Who paid that 94% and what did they pay it on? Well, you know? a very, very tiny portion of people. And the way that, that what we mean when we say marginal tax rates, let's just back up and make it make it right. a little simpler to start with. You bring a certain amount of money in. The government has a standard deduction that's today around 25 grand. So that you get to keep, you don't pay any taxes on. Now, after that first amount, with each subsequent additional dollar you make, you pay a little bit more taxes and they group them in segments. So there's, you know, for the first little hundred thousand, you pay X amount for the next amount and X amount. It goes up from there and it maxes out at 37 percent for anything over six hundred and twenty two thousand. Right. But we're not talking about just I want to make sure it's I just want to make sure we're we're in crystal clear. We're not saying that in any of these scenarios, because, you know, a lot of folks don't make $620,000 a year, so they don't <laughs> understand what happens when you get up there. We're not saying that the tax code says anybody who makes over $620,000 a year will pay X amount on their taxes. What the tax code, and correct me if I'm wrong, says is if you make over $100,000 a year, we're going to take a higher percentage of that little portion that is above $100,000 a year. So if you make $101,000 a year, then we're going to tax you at this rate for $100,000. And then that $1,000 that's above $100,000, we're going to tax you at a higher rate for. So exactly, is that right? That's exactly right. Okay. And so this is, and this is where the rigging of the economy begins, Clay. So we call it the bracket racket. All right, right now the top bracket is 37% and you only pay that if you're making above about 622,000. So that means that the next thousand you make above that number, 
you'll pay 37%, 37% for the rest of it. If you yeah. ever make above 600 and say it again, sorry. It's around $620,000. So if you ever are lucky enough to make $620,000 a year, then I you're still going to get lower taxes for all that money before 620, but after 620, anything above that is going to get the 37% marginal rate. 37%. Right? Okay. But keep in mind that you're going to pay that if you make 622,000 a year, if you make a million a year, if you make 10 million a year, if you make 50 million a year, if you make 100 a year. And this is one of the things we talk about in the book. Because the top marginal bracket is so low, um, and it ends at 622,000. People who are making 600,000 are basically treated the same as people making 10 million. And we think there's a big difference between $622,000 a year and 10 million a year. So we'd like to see a number of more tax brackets to be put into place. More the second piece though, Clay, oh, back yeah. up beyond that, because this is the piece I think that your listeners will probably be most interested in, is that the just from the beginning, the tax code treats your money differently depending on how you make it. Mm -hmm. So if you work for a living, you have a different set of tax rates than if you invest for a living. And if you just inherit money, that's an entirely different set of tax rates. So three different kinds of treatment in the tax code, whether you work, whether you invest, or whether you inherit. And the worst game in town, Clay, is to work for a living. The highest taxes are paid by working people, whereas investors, in contrast, pay on average about half the tax rate of people who work for a living. So to make it real for you, if I made $100,000 this year working every day, and Morris made $100,000 this year selling some stock on his E-Trade account, I would pay around eight or nine thousand dollars in taxes on my income that I made from working. Morris, in contrast, for his money, his same amount of money, hundred thousand that he made from investing, Morris would pay zero taxes. So I've worked all year. Morris hadn't done a thing except for sold some stock. I end the year about nine thousand dollars poorer than Morris. Lucky Morris. Up from there. Yeah, Lucky Morris. Uh, Morris, who started the problem here? I mean, I, there's a whole bunch to talk about in this, but if you're talking about 94% and then down to 7% or 70%, and now we're all the way down to 30, who do you think Morris is? Who, who, who is the biggest um, criminal when it comes to changing these, these tax expectations or this tax code over the past 50, 60 years? Well, it's, I mean, it's been going on for a long time. I would just, if you're checking the numbers, all of our examples for married people, by the way, I, mm -hmm. I mean, it's from the 1960s, it's been going down ever since the peaks that Erica talked about, you know, in the Eisenhower administration. But it, I think the attitude really started when Ronald Reagan tried to tell all the Americans that, oh, government is the problem not the solution you should have less government and government is just a word for people doing things together working together getting things done you know are the founding fathers called you know these states they created commonwealths because they understood we needed common wealth to get things done for the common good and somehow you know 200 odd years later Americans are now being told, no, it's wrong to do things together. It's wrong for some people to help other people. It's wrong for everyone not to be independent. And that's been going on for most of my lifetime, really. And we, and I think just now, Americans have finally realized that and want to change it. The reason I asked the question and you said exactly what I was expecting, the name that I knew I would hear at some point was going to be Reagan, because, it, correct me if I'm wrong, the biggest drop in, the biggest cut was put into put into place in the 80s, where the, the marginal tax rate dropped dramatically from the 60s to the 30s. Um, and And at that point, you're in a position where it's never gone back up, right? I mean, we've got George George H. W. Bush ran on a platform of no new taxes, read my lips. And while he did add some taxes, he still never increased the marginal rate. And there have not been any big 
adjustments upward to this marginal rate at all um, since since you know the '60s and when you started when you said they started dropping. Is are we just at a point where anyone who dares increase the rate, even if it doesn't affect me, um, I'm going to oppose because I hear the word tax increase. Um, oh, do we have any hope for this being able to be I think, increased? I think, Clay, we do have hope. I really think we do. I think that particularly since the tax cut at the end of 2017, that people have realized only affected the richest people and didn't do anyone else any good. I think since then, people have actually come around to realize this. And partially through the efforts of Erica and her team, and you know, and the whole team and the publishers at New Press and everyone else, our book is becoming very popular, but more important, our message is becoming very popular. It's gone from sort of off on the fringe five or 10 years ago to on the stage of the presidential debates at the last election to in the Senate Finance Committee, people proposing to tax the rich. So I really do think the tide is turning. And I think now but is Eric our time. But Erica, you have to, I mean, you you grew up in the same town I did. You know that this message probably plays to a lot of folks in this area and a lot of red states, especially as socialism, redistribution of wealth, which again, I'm you don't have to convince me <laughs> because I understand that the people who are who are afraid of socialism are often the folks who probably benefit from it. But how do you how do you combat that um, sort of fear t tactic, um, scare tactic, sorry, fear mongering, when you are trying to convince people that the tax code needs to be changed and working classes are not favored by the current tax code. And, you know, we want to tax the rich, the job creators, um, which isn't untrue, but is a little bit disingenuous. How do you how do you combat that? Yeah, well, so a couple of things. I think the first way to combat anything is to provide people good information. And the lucky thing about taxes is it really is just math. So for all it's kind of complicated from the outside, it's not particularly complicated when you climb into it. And so we produced a book that is chock full of cartoons and illustrations. And it, we wrote it in very, very, very accessible language, Clay, because we want people to understand this topic. We need their voices right now. The book, the first chapter in the book is what is rich. And the second chapter is what is the economy? We really try to take it piecemeal. We take you through the entire book thing. If you read this book cover to cover, you will know everything you need to know to engage in this tax debate. That's number one. The second piece is that the American people are with us, Clay. The vast majority of Democrats, independents, and Republicans believe that millionaires and billionaires and corporations should pay substantially higher taxes. In fact, if you look at the polls about President Biden's infrastructure proposal to build our rural broadband, to um, fix our roads and bridges, to provide services like daycare, if you talk to people about those plans, they like the plans a lot. When you tell them that it's going to be paid for by increasing taxes on corporations, support for the Biden infrastructure plan goes up 10 points, which in polling terms is a seismic shift. So everybody in America has had it. They can see these rich people getting away with murder. They see them paying off colleges to get into the elite schools. They see them dodging taxes. There's there's about $7 trillion dollars. Of, hit, of money hidden overseas. and people But then kidding. their bosses tell them, Erica, that if you raise my taxes, I'm going to have to lay you off. Well, first of all, your boss is lying to you if he tells you that. And this is one of the things we talk about in the book also, is that they try to make a correlation between corporate tax cuts and job creations. And even the premise of that is illogical on its face. Because okay, I agree with you. Tell me why. If you run a business, your revenue comes in, you take out your expenses like payroll and your cost of goods sold, and then you have your profit. You are taxed only on your profit. 
But if you cut my taxes, Erica, I can use that savings to hire more people, right? Okay. I'm playing devil's advocate for you, but keep it going. Yeah, yeah, sure. That's what the CEO said in the lead up to the Trump tax cut. AT&T, Randall Stevenson, huge cheerleader for the corporate tax cut, insisted they would hire tons of people if only the government would lower their tax rate. Well, the government lowered their tax rate from 35% to 21% and AT&T laid off 40,000 people. So the CEOs of America are simply lying to you. Why are they lying to you? Because they are paid on profits and they don't want any of those profits going to fund things like roads, bridges, schools, and rural broadband, because if they have lower taxes, they bring home less money and they are not able to afford their private jets their luxury yachts, and their art collections. Okay, so so Morris, there are people like you who have done very well financially, who are in these patriotic millionaire, the patriotic millionaires group. Why are some of you (laughs) willing to see do this and understand this, but others are not? What is it? What what made what make what's the difference between those like yourself and Warren Buffett, who has also said very similar things um, about his tax rate being lower than his secretaries? Why? How are you getting folks to join you, Morris? And why are others not? It's a it's a word of mouth kind of thing. But frankly, most people we talk to are on our side. Not everyone wants to send in money and become a dues paying right. member to send in money to help support the staff. But I think most people agree with our premise. It's just a lot of people are kind of afraid. People that, you know, are stockbrokers, oh, I don't want to say anything that one of my clients might not like. You know, or people in the asset management business, oh, well, I don't want to, pr- I can't promote a policy that, you know, might be against my client's interest or my customers or something. They're afraid because they've been taught this, this ridiculous story about, oh, we must appease the rich people. Or if we don't appease them, they'll take their money and move to Somalia or something. I mean, let me tell you, Clay, they're not going to move to Somalia. I've been to Somalia. They are definitely not yeah, going to I mean, move to nobody, Somalia. <laughs> people want to live in the United States of America because this is the kind of place where you can build businesses and make fortunes. And there's just somehow they were given this line that we must appease the rich or else they'll move away. And people bought it. And talk about, Erica, the 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 ideal sort of tax structure. I mean, you're not talking about raising the the marginal rate from 37% to 96, 70, any, it's something so high on people who are making anything over 600,000. You're talking about adding more rungs to the ladder, correct? That's exactly right. And I just want to clarify, from the beginning, the patriotic millionaires are 10 years old. From the beginning, we have said we only have any interest in taxing people who make more than $1 million a year in income. So if you make $999,999.99, we do not want you to pay higher taxes. If you, on the other hand, make $1 million and $1 next year, we would like you to pay higher taxes on that additional dollar. The other people we want to tax are people who have assets of $5 million, okay? This does not include, we do not consider you rich for our purposes if you have a home worth $2 million and you have a million dollar mortgage left on it and you make $300,000 a year. We don't have any interest in taxing you. We want to tax people who make a million dollars or more of income a year and people who have assets of $5 million a year. And the first way we want to do that is to make sure that all the money that people bring in over a million dollars is treated the same. Right now, if I inherited $11 million, I would pay zero taxes on that inherited fortune. If I work for a living, you, you know, entertainers, if you're an entertainer, and you make $11 million, you will pay around $4 million in taxes. So you know the loopholes, right? (laughs) Because there's plenty of those. You can cry me a river for somebody making $11 million a year, but we don't see any reason why inherited income 
or investment income should be treated differently than ordinary income when you're talking about money over a million dollars a year. Working people are getting screwed, Quay. They are paying twice the tax rate of the richest people in the country. And talk about some of those loopholes, because there's different tax rates, as you mentioned already once before, on whether or not you are a corporation or you are an individual. So corporations themselves pay pay less taxes than individuals do. That's right. Corporations right now have a top statutory rate, meaning the stated rate is 21%. It used to be 35% until Trump and the Republicans rewrote the whole federal tax code in 2017. But 21% is substantially lower than the 37% that working people are making. And most corporations have so many loopholes they take advantage of that you may have seen a report a few days ago that 55 of the biggest companies in the country paid zero federal income tax last year, including FedEx, Nike, Hewlett Packard, and the list goes on. There's a bunch of shenanigans in the tax code that have to be dealt with. Morris, what about, you know, there was, I loved the West Wing when it was on, loved it. (laughs) And there was a line in that show that had always stuck out to me that I'm not a great quote rememberer, but there was one in that one where they said, the problem with the American dream is everybody believes one day they'll be rich. So you're you're fighting against this American dream where, yeah, I may not be making over $600,000 now, but I one day want to be making a million dollars a year. And therefore, like, what, how do you, com- how do you combat that? I mean, <laughs> I, think, but Clay, I mean, I guess the thing I said, we don't really have to combat it because the American people are on our side, including the vast majority of Republicans. People agree that millionaires and corporations need to pay higher taxes. The people who don't agree with that are the bought and paid for politicians in Washington and their millionaire and billionaire backers. That's the the fight. The fight is not against average Joe walking down the street. They may or may not believe that they're going to get to be wealthy one day, but even if they think they're going to be wealthy, polls have shown that the vast majority of regular people recognize the fact that millionaires, billionaires, and corporations are not paying their fair share and that the middle class is holding the bag. I think even the guys who think they're going to be millionaires someday are okay with paying a higher tax rate on their second million and their tenth million. And we have no intention of taxing them on their first million dollars. So I think they're okay with that. I really do. What, Morris, do you think would be, uh, let's assume in a real world scenario that this administration or any other administration who might agree with you, um, future administration may agree with you, uh, can't get everything they want. Um, What, Morris, do you think is more pressing, the changing the tax code and addressing the, the wealthiest American individuals, the Jeff Bezos, the the Warren Buffetts, the Mark Zuckerbergs the, of the world, or addressing the tax loopholes that corporations um, are paying, because they're two very different things. Well, I think, I mean, I think the former is very important, because the richest people in our country basically pay very little taxes. Because they're so rich, they don't need any income. And we only tax income, not wealth. Somebody like Mr. Bezos has never made very much income. He doesn't need to. He's a billionaire. So he can sell little bits of the stock in the company that he founded every year if he wants to and have some capital gains on which he pays very little taxes. And he doesn't need any actual income. Warren Buffett's income has been only $100,000 a year for many years. He doesn't need much income either, even though he's a wealthy billionaire. So I think that's part of the problem is that the wealthiest among us don't pay taxes because we only charge income taxes. When our country was created, our tax system was based on real estate taxes and almost all wealth was real estate. So people did pay tax based on their wealth back in the day. We've shifted that now. And I mean, people still do pay real estate taxes if they're homeowners. 
But we now don't do that anymore. And I think we have to go back to that system where the wealthiest people pay a tax on a tiny percentage of their wealth every year. And Clay, I'd like to pick up on this also, if I could, with Morris. So let's let's take Jeff Bezos. Okay, news came out a couple of days ago that he bought a little baby yacht to help tend to his massive yacht that he is building. <laughs> he is building a five hundred million dollar yacht for his like you do. You know. okay. Let me tell you how the tax code treats that yacht. Okay, if Jeff Bezos or anybody else had. 50 homes in 50 states in America, each worth $10 million, okay? They would pay property tax on those homes, various rates from like basically one to about 3%, depending on where you live. For most Americans, the vast majority of their wealth is in their home. So they pay tax on their wealth, which is their home. If Jeff Bezos owned 50 houses in 50 states, each worth $10 million, he would also pay property tax, wealth tax on that property. But he doesn't need to do that. If he gets rid of all those houses and dumps that money into his new half a billion dollar yacht, his wealth tax bill is zero because he does not have property. He has a yacht. If he takes that money and sticks it into a pink diamond, a Picasso painting, a statue, a racehorse, you know, he he essentially doesn't pay taxes on his wealth, whereas every working stiff in America who owns a home pays a tax annually on their wealth. So Why is Jeff Bezos paying less on his wealth than your average homeowner in Dayton, Ohio, is paying on their wealth? OK, so that so you're also talking about not just increasing the income tax for those who make income. You're talking about adding potentially something to address the fact that Jeff Bezos only makes a dollar a year from Amazon. Um, and this wealth tax would would be a tax on his property tax. or on his it's stock tax. holdings or what? Yeah, on his total number of assets. So whatever those assets are, normal people keep most of their money in their house. If they have wealth at all, which half of Americans don't, but the ones that do, maybe they have some money in a 401k or retirement account, a little money in the stock market, but they basically focus on paying down their house by the time they retire. So that's their central asset. That's their wealth. They pay annual taxes on that wealth. Jeff Bezos and other rich people like him, in contrast, they may own some houses, but the vast majority of their their wealth is either in the stock market, it's in art, it's in jewelry, it's in one of them. I've read something the other day, some dude spent, um, I think, $12 million on a 12-foot shark that <laughs> an artist, I don't know what he did to the shark. But what happens like, when it dies? I mean, <laughs> Anyway, he doesn't pay, they don't pay taxes on any of their wealth, whereas regular Americans pay taxes on their wealth. So we like to see a wealth tax. We like to see the- Now, do you pay both of those? If you're a person who has a great deal of of wealth accumulated um, and you've got, you know, 10 million in stocks that you're getting dividends on or whatnot, and you're also making a million dollars a year in income- are you paying in this scenario tax on your income and tax on your existing wealth? Mm. Yeah. If, if you're making millions of dollars a year in income and have millions of dollars a year in wealth, then yeah, the same way a working American who owns a home both pays real estate taxes and income taxes, we think the, the richest people in America, if they own whatever they own, whether it's stocks and bonds or diamonds and sharks, if they own <laughs> stuff that's worth millions of dollars Love that he has a shark. and they have millions of dollars of income, then they should both pay a property tax, a wealth tax. And what's it. this wealth tax? I mean, how much is it? What's the, what's the rate? Well, there are various proposals. I mean, the way things work in Washington is that people start to surface ideas, like the even concept that there should be a wealth tax. And then various lawmakers will put forward different proposals about how that wealth should be taxed. So right now there's a proposal that Elizabeth Warren has put together. I think it's 2% on some chunk and maybe 3% over a billion. Bernie Sanders has put forth some pieces. I'm sure other lawmakers will come in. This wealth tax idea is something that just over the last several years has started to surface. And now, it's an annual thing, right? 
the wealth tax would be an annual tax. And we're still talking um, about zero up until millions of dollars. Right, but if it's two, if it's two percent on the one hundred billion dollars, that oh, I guess what Larry Ellison's probably at that level. I can't keep up with the numbers. They yeah. keep there's so many who keep going above that. But if if it's two percent on that, then you're talking about two billion dollars in taxes that Larry Ellison would have to pay, probably every year because his number keeps going up, right? And his number will correct. still continue to go up because that's less the amount by which his number generally goes up year to year. And it's less than the return that he usually, that most people make on those investments. That's exactly right. And that's why, Clay, we actually don't think that Elizabeth Warren's proposal goes far enough. It doesn't actually mitigate the inequality at the top end of the income scale. We would like to see a wealth tax put in that started to take money away from the richest people in the country so we can start to bring the portions of our society back together. Our solution for the country as a whole is to start making corporations and millionaires pay their fair share, reinvest in our communities in a variety of ways, but really deliberately use the tax code to have them be less rich. Because if you only tax them at 2% and their return at five, is at 5%, then they're still going to make that additional 3% spread on a huge amount of money, which means as years go on, we're going to be more and more unequal. And we're right now more unequal than we've been in 100 years. And our society is not very stable right now. What, what do you say to the people who are going to say to you, that just sounds punitive? Like, you don't like rich people, so we're going to punish them. Look, we are well, the, first of all, I would say the most, go ahead, Morris. <laughs> say, we are the patriotic millionaires. We I was going to say, people. do you feel punished? We like rich, we people. Like rich people. We think everyone should be rich. We just think that those people who are very rich should pay a little bit more in taxes so that those people who are not rich don't have the, to shoulder the entire burden by themselves. I mean, the richest people will still be the richest people, even if they pay one percent or two percent or three percent of their wealth in taxes every year while they're multi-billionaires we're only talking about multi-billionaires at that level even with senator warren's proposal so yeah no we're not trying to be against rich people we're actually for everybody we just think that we all need to come together a little bit more and divide up the cost of running the country a little bit more fairly among people so that we have a stable country we actually think everybody should be on our side. We're not against anybody, but we're for everybody. Erica, you were going to have an answer to that, too. Is it punitive? Do you, do you dislike them? You mad at them for being rich? No, no I'm, not, I'm not mad at them for being rich. I am extremely mad at wealthy people who spend a tremendous amount of money and political power to continue to rig an economy in their favor. They get special breaks in the tax code. They push labor into a meager existence. Our minimum wage right now, Clay, is $7.25 an hour, which translates for full-time work into $15,000 a year. And we have corporate leaders out there pulling down 20, 30, 40 million dollars a year, going out on TV and saying that raising the minimum wage to a livable wage would destroy their business. I disagree. And I also will say where we're from, Clay, you know, there are a whole lot of plantation owners sitting around thinking they were real good business owners, you know, business people back in the day. And so I reject that notion to begin with. If your business is built on human exploitation, you are not a good businessman. You are a bad person. And I want to tax you regardless. But I mean, let, let's not let's not be all sunshine and roses about the folks who have wealth in this country. I'm not doing this to punish people who have wealth. But I do think we need to recognize that a great deal of wealth that is in the hands of a very small number of people right now is in their hands because they exploited a lot of people and hurt a lot of lives. And we can go through part and parcel example after example of that, beginning with the Sackler family, who currently has 2.5 million people addicted to opioids. You know, we just I did mean, an episode on them two weeks ago. <laughs> and more, this is a place where Morris and I have a, have a little disagreement. You know, I mean, he, he's much more even handed about it. I'm mad. I am mad. I think Americans should be mad that, that, 
billions of dollars was made off of getting people addicted to opioids and then to add insult to injury, they don't even pay their fair share of taxes. I want to I want to get to some questions because we have several good questions that were sent in from folks. But I, I want to ask who you think your biggest challenge is or the biggest challenge you have to overcome uh, when it comes to getting some of these policies that you propose passed. Is it um, is it it's the Chamber of Commerce? It's the business roundtable and it's the money flowing from corporate lobbyists into politicians offices. The problem is That's that all about. these political leaders spend all of their time talking to their major donors. You know, I pick up my phone. It's almost always a call from 430 South Capitol Street, some politician calling, looking for more donations. And the problem is that even the best of them spend all of their time talking to donors who are almost by definition wealthy people, people who can afford to give thousands upon thousands of dollars every year. And I'm not even in the top 100 on the list, okay? And those people who can give hundreds of thousands of dollars, you know, the, the saying is you can't buy votes, but you can buy time with senators and representatives. And they spend all of their time listening to the frustrations of a few greedy rich people who just think it's just unreasonable and unfair that they have these problems of having to pay taxes. Trust me, I, I don't like to make it too much about my experience. But when I ran for Congress, I spent way more time having to raise money than I ever would have seen on West Wing. He never picked up the phone to raise money at all. <laughs> Why don't we have politicians that are like that? And that is, I mean, um, and, and real politicians do. And, and no, the, you're right. the problem is, I mean, even a few West Wing episodes had to do with donors, but um, I, yes. watched the, I was once sick. My wife got me the set of DVDs. I watched the entire it was worth it, it from beginning to end <laughs> once when I was sick for a few days. <laughs> when it ended, I didn't watch the last episode because I didn't want it to be over. I oh. wanted him to be my president. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. Um, and, but that's the problem. They've been all their time with those donors and they really know really well all the frustrations. And after a few years, they've like internalized it in their brains that, oh, oh, Taxes. That's bad. We have to get rid of those taxes so these people don't have these frustrations and problems. And and they have to run again in two years or six years, and therefore they need to make sure they keep those folks happy for the next time they got to make a phone call and, and get a check. Um, I'll have to let – me, um, let me ask – okay, it's either Anastasia or Anastasia from Miami, Florida. Sorry, Anastasia, Anastasia, asks, um, when people talk about – progressive taxes. Wouldn't we be in better shape if they increased with age instead of income? No. no. We have plenty. Okay, I don't understand the question, but I thought it was interesting, so I thought I'd throw it at you. Um, Morris, your response was a little more animated, so let's go with you. Yeah, we have plenty of old people who are not rich. <laughs> right. And we have, <laughs> Where's their income coming from? We have some from? young people who are very rich. I mean, we want to tax people who make more money more than people who make less money. We don't want to tax old people more than young people if the old people are poor and the young people are rich. That that doesn't... They're usually on fixed incomes and then most of their money's coming from yeah, Social Security. Those who anyway, are so... rich, we think, should pay higher taxes. I mean, we think it should be based on whether or not you're rich or make a lot of money, not on your age. So I, I my answer is no. Okay, Erica, Tony from Salt Lake City asks... Bringing capital to the disadvantaged is important, but if CEOs and financiers won't hit the streets to change the culture, won't any cash just end up back in their pockets with a little extra social credit on the side? I don't think I understand the question. I, I, let me read it again. Bringing capital to the disadvantaged, I, I, he, I'll, let me take out this part and just get to... Um, I guess he's saying CEOs and financiers won't hit the streets to change... It, that if CEOs and financiers don't actually get involved to change the culture, then will we get anything done? I guess what Tony's asking, sorry, Tony, um, a little verbose there. He's asking, he's asking, don't you have to have those CEOs yeah. and financiers getting involved in order to? Well, so 
so there was a study done out of Princeton several years ago that showed that regular people have a statistical zero chance of having any impact on public policy unless either the investor community or you know the investor community and the business community support them. Um, that I don't know if that is entirely true, but the study showed that it was, and it certainly feels true. It's one of the reasons for the patriotic millionaires. Um, we think it's very important to have a business and investor voice um, offering a counter weight to the self-interested business voices that we hear out of the Chamber of Commerce and the Business Roundtable. <clears throat> the Chamber of Commerce is the largest lobbying organization in the country. It basically represents, it pretends like it represents, you know, these small chambers of, I mean, I remember going to events at the Chamber of Commerce in Raleigh. That is not the National Chamber of Commerce. The I, National think, Chamber I think of most Commerce, people think Chambers of Commerce are do. parts of the government. <laughs> and, and the most in the chamber of the national chamber of commerce which is the biggest lobbying organization in the country actually represents about 60 of the biggest companies in the country and so they have they put forth this assertion that they represent all business people in the land that is an inaccurate assertion they're actually the key lobbyist for 60 companies um, and so we wanted to bring together some business leaders and investors who have a different point of view. I think Morris says repeatedly to people, you know, he says he's not any more altruistic than the next person. He just wants to live in a different kind of country than a lot of other rich people do. Our country is failing right now, Clay. We have the highest level of uh, of inequality that we have had in 100 years. Our social fabric is ripping apart. I don't care what side of the political aisle you're on, you can see that. And it's because our wealthy people have been advantaged through the tax code for so long, they essentially live in a different universe. Our working class folks are working for seven fifty, eight bucks, nine dollars an hour, nobody can live on that. And people can recognize that they don't have any power in the system. The whole thing needs to be fixed. Um, just, yeah, go ahead. Just to, what your question may have been getting at is that these things really will help everybody. I think right now, just over here, there's people who don't know how they're going to pay their rent next month, for God's sakes, because they were laid off because of the pandemic. I think if we really change our society and we really have people feeling secure in their jobs, that's great for them, but it's also gonna help the landlords and the people that own the bodegas on their streets and the people who own the bars where they drink. And it really will end up helping rich investors too, if we're able to make our society more stable and have all the people who are laid off and are, tr are having trouble surviving and are sometimes taking o opioids to just take their mind off their problems back in the regular middle class existence that mo many of us grew up in and remember. Well, I will say that I, I find it, I've always found it somewhat ironic, the, uh, the slogan of make America great again, when <laughs> those times that a lot, that so many people are longing for the Donna Reed era, <laughs> I guess maybe. The Archie Bunker era. Were times when, when the, the marginal tax rate was a hell of a lot higher, the middle class was a load stronger, and the income inequality was far less. Um, and I will say, I, we have a, we have a great audience that, that goes out and actually reads the books that we of when we do have guests on who've written books and I will say I encourage you to to check this one out because what I think becomes incredibly complicated what, what becomes difficult about this argument is that the the talking points so to speak for um the this particular side this progressive side are difficult to fit on a bumper sticker often um in ways that I think the other side, the the rich folks who don't want to have taxes, um, have been able to to use f terms like job creators and socialism and wealth redistribution as, as scare tactics, and and the response to that can often be really really, like I said, weedsy and complicated and tough to digest and understand. And I have to say, I've got to give props 
to both of you and all those who worked on the book with you, because if you're interested in any of this, if you have been, um, I'm talking to listeners now, if you have been interested in this topic, if you have long believed that the wealthy are not paying their fair share and corporations are um, taking advantage of loopholes and getting away with not having to pay for the roads and bridges that you have to pay for and all that stuff, if you're like that and you can't win arguments at the dinner table at Thanksgiving (laughs) with your relatives who disagree with you, This is a book to grab because not only do they make them for you, but they explain it a lot of times in ways that are irrefutable and much easier to digest. So I want to make sure I get the whole um, subtitle in because all you need to do is search for Tax the Rich and Morris Pearl and Erica Payne, but the entire title is Tax the Rich, How Lies, Loopholes, and Lobbyists Make the Rich Even Richer. Lots of alliteration. Tax the Rich, How Lies, Loopholes, and Lobbyists Make the Rich Even Richer. It'll help you to, if, if this is a, t- a subject you're interested in, it'll help you to form your arguments very coherently, and you'll have Morris and Erica to thank for that. And I thank you both for doing this with us this week and for, for breaking some of this down. We do have a goal here with this show to not just show one particular side or the other, even though I am proud to own my bias often. But we try to show both sides, and we do want people to to get along better. Um, but in order to do that, you have to be educated. And I appreciate the fact that not only have you educated us this tonight and this week, but you um, have done it in the book. And I have to ask you, we'll, we'll start with you, Erica. We'll let Morris do it second. I got to ask you, Erica, how the heck are we going to get along? How are we going to get along? Wow. We're going to take a deep breath and we're going to realize that our future is a shared future. And we don't have any choice but to get along. We are in this together. I have a lot of people in my life who have different political views than I do. My father-in-law loves Donald Trump. I do not love Donald Trump. And, you know, he thinks there's a lot of good stuff in this book. So let's start with some math. Let's start getting people. Let's get back to a sense of basic fairness when it comes to the math at the heart of this country and at the heart of this economy. Let's start there. Morris Pearl, how the heck are we going to get along? That's the hardest question we've ever gotten. I mean, I think that, <laughs> it's no no one has the answer. I wish we all did, yeah. but everybody everybody adds to it. So I so let me know what you think. Yeah, I mean, I think as Erica said, it's a matter of people understanding that we're all in this together, and that we can't have a few people succeeding and with other people are failing because you can't. You can only succeed if we succeed together. And I think when we get people to understand that, we'll get along better. And at least we're going to try. I feel optimistic. I have a two-year-old granddaughter. 